part 1 the cognitive revolution an animal of no significance about 13.5 billion years ago matter energy time and space came into being in what is known as the big bang the story of these fundamental features of our universe is called physics about 300,000 years after their appearance, matter and energy started to coalesce into complex structures called atoms, which then combined into molecules. The story of atoms, molecules and their interactions is called chemistry. About 3.8 billion years ago, on a planet called Earth, Certain molecules combine to form particularly large and intricate structures called organisms. The story of organisms is called biology. About 70,000 years ago, organisms belonging to the species Homo sapiens started to form even more elaborate structures called cultures. The subsequent development of these human cultures is called history. Three important revolutions shaped the course of history. The cognitive revolution kick-started history about 70,000 years ago. The agricultural revolution sped it up about 12,000 years ago. The scientific revolution which got underway only 500 years ago may well end history and start something completely different. This book tells the story of how these three revolutions have affected humans and their fellow organisms. There were humans long before there was history. Animals, much like modern humans, first appeared about 2.5 million years ago. But for countless generations, they did not stand out from the myriad other organisms with which they shared their habitats. On a hike in East Africa two million years ago, you might well have encountered a familiar cast of human characters, anxious mothers cuddling their babies and clutches of carefree children playing in the mud. Temperamental youths shopping against the dictates of society and weary elders who just wanted to be left in peace. Chest thumping machos trying to impress the local beauty and wise old matriarchs who had already seen it all. The, uh, these archaic humans loved, played, formed close friendships and competed for status and power. But so did chimpanzees baboons and elephants. There was nothing special about humans. Nobody, least of all humans themselves, had any inkling that their descendants would one day walk on the moon, split the atom, fathom the genetic code, and write history books. The most important thing to know about prehistoric humans is that they were insignificant animals with no impact on their environment than gorillas, fireflies, or jellyfish. Biologists classify organisms into species. Animals are said to belong to the same species if they tend to mate with each other, giving birth to fertile offspring. Horses and donkeys have a recent common ancestor and share many physical traits, but they show little sexual interest in one another. They will mate if induced to do so, but their offspring called mules are sterile. Mutations in donkey DNA can therefore never cross over to horses or vice versa. The two types of animals are consequently considered two distinct species moving along separate evolutionary paths. By contrast, a bulldog and a spaniel may look very different, but they are members of the same species, sharing the same DNA pool. They will happily mate and their puppies will grow up to pair off 
with other dogs and produce more puppies. Species that evolve from a common ancestors are bunched together under the heading genus. Lions, tigers, leopards, jaguars are different species within the genus Panthera. Biologists label organisms with a two-part Latin name genus followed by species. Lions, for example, are called Panthera leo. The species leo of the genus Panthera. Presumably, everyone reading this book is a Homo sapiens. The species sapiens wise of the genus Homo man. Genera is the turn are grouped into families, such as the cats, lions, cheetahs, house cats, the dogs, wolves, foxes, jackals, and the elephants, mammoths, mastodons. All members of a family trace their linkage back to a founding matriarch or patriarch. All cats, for example, from the smallest house kitten to the most ferocious lion, share a common feline ancestor who lived about 25 million years ago. Homo sapiens too belong to a family this banal fact used to be one of history's most closely guarded secrets. Homo sapiens long preferred to view itself as a part of from animals and orphan of family lacking siblings or cousins and most importantly without parents. But that's just not the case. Like it or not, we are members of a large and particularly noisy family called the Great Apes. Our closest living relatives include chimpanzees, gorillas, and orang utans. These chimpanzees are the closest just 6 million years ago. A single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor for all chimpanzees. The other is our own grandmother. Homo sapiens has kept hidden an even more disturbing secret. Not only do we possess an abundance of uncivilized cousins, once upon a time we had quite a few brothers and sisters as well. We are used to thinking about ourselves as the only humans because for the last 10,000 years, our species has indeed been the only human species around. Yet the real meaning of the word human is an animal belonging to the genus Homo, and there used to be many other species of this genus besides Homo sapiens. Moreover, as we shall see in the last chapter of the book, in the not so distant future we might again have to contend with non-sapiens humans. To clarify this point, I will often use the term sapiens to denote members of the species Homo sapiens while reserving the term human to refer to all extant members of the genus Homo. Humans first evolved in East Africa about 2.5 million years ago from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus, which means southern ape. About 2 million years ago, some of these archaic men and women left their homeland to journey through the settled, vast areas of North Africa, Europe, and Asia. Since survival in the snowy forest of Northern Europe required different traits than those needed to stay alive in Indonesia's steaming jungles, human populations evolved in different directions. The result was several distinct species of each of which scientists have assigned a pompous Latin name. Humans in Europe and Western Asia evolved into human Neander, man of the Neander Valley, properly referred to simply as Neanderthals. Neanderthals, bulkier, are more muscular than us sapiens, were well adapted to the cold climate of Ice Age Western Eurasia. The more eastern regions of Asia were populated by Homo erectus, upright man, who survived there for close to 2 million years, making it the most durable human species ever. 
This record is unlikely to be broken even by our own species. It is doubtful whether Homo sapiens will still be around a thousand years from now, so two million years is really out of our league. On the island of Java in Indonesia lived Homo solonesis, man from the Solo Valley, who was suited to life in the tropics. On another Indonesian island, the small island of Flores, archaic humans underwent a process of dwarfing. Humans first reached Flores when the sea level was exceptionally low and the island was easily accessible from the mainland. When the seas rose again, some people were trapped on the island which was poor in resources. Big people who need a lot of food died first. Smaller fellows survived much better. Over the generations, the people of Flores became dwarves. This unique species, known by scientists as Homo floresiensis, reached a maximum height of only 1 meter and weighed no more than 25 kilograms. They were nevertheless able to produce stone tolls and even managed occasionally to hunt down some of the island's elephants, though to be fair, the elephants were a dwarf species as well. In 2010, another lost sibling was rescued from oblivion. When scientists excavating the Denisova cave in Siberia discovered a fossil finger bone, Genetic analysis proved that the finger belonged to a previously unknown human species which was named Homo denisova. Who knows how many lost relatives of ours are waiting to be discovered in other caves on other islands and in other climes. While these humans were evolving in Europe, and Asia, evolution in East Africa did not stop. The cradle of humanity continued to nurture numerous new species such as Homo rudolfensis, man from Lake Rudolph, Homo ergaster, working man, and eventually our own species which we have immodestly named Homo sapiens wise man. The members of some of those species were massive and others were dwarves. Some were fearsome hunters and others meek plant gatherers. Some lived only a single island while many roamed over continents, but all of them belonged to the genus Homo. They were all human beings. It's a common fallacy to envision these species are arranged in a straight line of descent with Ergaster begetting Erectus, Erectus begetting the Neanderthals, the Neanderthals evolving into us. This linear model gives the mistaken impression that at any particular moment, only one type of human inhabited the earth, and that all early species were merely older model of ourselves. The truth is, that from about 2 million years ago until around 10,000 years ago, the world was home at one and the same time to several human species and why not? Today there are many species of foxes, bears and pigs, the earth of 100 millennia ago was walked by at least 6 different species of man. It's our current exclusivity, not that multi-species past that is peculiar and perhaps incriminating. As we will shortly see, we sapiens have good reasons to repress the memory of our siblings. Despite their many differences, all human species share several defining characteristics. Most notably, humans have extraordinarily large brains compared to other animals. Mammals weighing 60 kg have an average brain size of 200 cubic centimeters. The earliest men and women 2.5 million years ago had brains of about 600 cubic centimeters. Modern sapiens sport a brain averaging 1200 to 1400 cubic centimeters. Neanderthals 
Neanderthal brains were even bigger. That evolution should select for larger brains may seem to us like, well, a no-brainer. We are so enamored of our high intelligence that we assume that when it comes to cerebral power, more must be better. But if that were the case, the feline family would also have produced cats who could do calculus and frogs would by now have launched their own space program. Why are giant brains so rare in the animal kingdom? The fact is that a jumbo brain is a jumbo drain on the body. It's not easy to carry around, especially when encased inside a massive skull. It's even harder to fuel. In Homo sapiens, the brain accounts for about 2-3% to of total body weight. But it consumes 25% of body's energy when the body is at rest. By comparison, the brains of other apes require only 8% of the rest time energy. Archaic humans paid for their large brains in two ways. Firstly, they spend more time in search of food. Secondly, their muscles atrophied. Like a government diverting money from defense to education, humans diverted energy from biceps to neurons. It's hardly a foregone conclusion that this is a good strategy for survival on the savanna. A chimpanzee can't win an argument with a homo sapien, but the ape can rip the man apart like a rag doll. Today, our big brains pay off nicely. Because we can produce cars and guns that enable us to move much faster than chimps and shoot them from a safe distance instead of wrestling. But cars and guns are recent phenomena. For more than 2 million years ago, human neural network kept growing and growing. But apart from the some flint knives and pointed sticks, humans had precious little to show for it. What then drove forward? The evolution of the massive human brains during those two million years. Frankly, we don't know. Another singular human trait is that we walk upright on two legs. Standing up, it's easier to scan the savanna for game or enemies and arms that are unnecessary for locomotion. Are freed for other purpose like throwing stones or signaling. The more things these hands could do, the more successful their owners were, so evolutionary pressure brought about an increasing concentration of nerves and finally tuned muscles in the palms and fingers. As a result, humans can perform very intricate tasks with their hands. In particular, they can produce and use sophisticated tools. The first evidence for tool production dates from about 2.5 million years ago and the manufacture and use of the tools are the criteria by which archaeologists recognize hum ancient humans. Yes, walking upside has its own downside. The skeleton of our primate ancestors developed for millions of years to support a creature that walked on all fours and had a relatively small head. Adjusting to an upright position was quite a challenge especially when the scaffolding had to support an extra large cranium. Humankind paid for its lofty vision and industrious hands with backaches and stiff necks. Women paid extra. An upright gait required narrower hips constricting the birth canal. And this just when babies' head were getting bigger and bigger. Death in childbirth became a major hazard for human females. Women who gave birth earlier, when the infant's brain and head were still relatively small and supple, fared better and lived to have more children. Natural selection consequently favored earlier births. And indeed, compared to other animals, humans are born prematurely, when many of their vital systems are still underdeveloped. A colt can trot shortly after birth. A kitten leaves its mother to forage on its own when it is just a few weeks old. Human babies are helpless, dependent for many years on their elders for sustenance, protection and education. This fact has contributed greatly 
both to humankind's extraordinary social abilities and to its unique social problems. Lone mothers could hardly forage enough food for their offspring and themselves with needy children in tow. Raising children required constant help from other family members and neighbors. It takes a tribe to raise a human. Evolution thus favored those capable of forming strong social ties. In addition, since humans are born underdeveloped, they can be educated and socialized to a far greater extent than any other animal. Most mammals emerge from the womb like glazed earthenware emerging from a kiln, any attempt at remolding will only scratch or break them. Humans emerge from the womb like molten glass from a furnace. They can be spun, stretched and shaped with a surprising degree of freedom. This is why today we can educate our children to become Christian and Buddhist, capitalist, socialist warlike or peace-loving. We assume that a large brain, the use of tools, superior learning abilities and complex social structures are human advantages. It seems self-evident that these have made humankind the most powerful animal on earth. But humans enjoyed all of these advantages for a full two million years during which they remained weak and marginal creatures. Thus humans who lived a million years ago, despite their big brains and sharp stone tools, dwelt in constant fear of predators, rarely hunted large game, and subsisted mainly by gathering plants. Scooping up insects, stalking small animals, and eating the carrion left behind by other more powerful carnivores. One of the most common uses of early stone tools was to crack open bones in order to get to the marrow. Some researchers believe this was our original niche. Just as woodpeckers specialize in extracting insects from the trunks of trees when the first human specialized in extracting marrow from bones, why marrow? Well. Suppose you observe a pride of lions take down and devour a giraffe. You wait patiently until they are done. But it's still not your turn because first the hyenas and jackals and you don't dare interfere with them. Scavenge the leftovers, only then would you and your band dare approach the carcass. Look cautiously left and right and dig into the edible tissue that remained. This is a key to understanding our history and psychology. Janus Homo's position in the food chain was, until quite recently, solidly in the middle. For millions of years, humans hunted smaller creatures and gathered what they could. All the while, being hunted by largest predators, it was only 400,000 years ago that several species of man began to hunt large game on a regular basis. And only in the last 100,000 years with the rise of Homo sapiens that man jumped to the top of the food chain. The spectacular leap from the middle to the top had enormous consequences. Other animals at the top of the pyramid such as lions and sharks, evolved into that position very gradually over millions of years. This enabled the ecosystem to develop checks and balances that prevent lions and sharks from wreaking too much havoc. As lions became deadlier, so gazelles evolved to run faster, hyenas to cooperate better and rhin rhino to be more bad-tempered. In contrast, humankind ascended to the top so quickly that the ecosystem was not given time to adjust. Moreover, humans themselves failed to adjust. Most top predators of the planet are majestic creatures, 
Millions of years of dominion have filled them with self-confidence. Sapiens, by contrast, is more likely a banana republic dictator. Having so recently been one of the underdogs of the savanna, we are full of fears and anxieties over our position, which makes us doubly cruel and dangerous. Many historical calamities from deadly wars to ecological catastrophes have resulted from this over hasty jump. A significant on the way to the top was a domestication of fire. Some human species may have made occasional use of fire as early as 800,000 years ago. By about 300,000 years ago, Homo erectus, Neanderthals and the forefathers of Homo sapiens were using fire on a daily basis. Humans now had a dependable source of light and warmth and a deadly weapon against prowling lions. Not long afterwards, humans may even have started deliberately to torch their neighborhoods. A carefully managed fire could turn impossible barren thickets into prime grasslands reaming with game. In addition, once the fire died down, Stone Age entrepreneurs could walk through the smoking remains and harvest charcoal, animals, nuts, and tubers. But the best thing fire did was cook. Foods that human cannot digest in their natural forms, such as wheat, rice, and potatoes, became staples of our diet thanks to cooking. Fire not only changed food's chemistry, it changed its biology as well. Cooking killed germs and parasites that infested food. Humans also had a far easier time chewing and digesting old favorites, such as fruits, nuts, insects, and carrion if they were cooked. Whereas chimpanzees spend five hours a day chewing raw food, a single hour suffices for people eating cooked food. The advent of cooking enabled humans to eat more kinds of food, to devote less time to eating and to make do with smaller teeth and shorter intestines. Some scholars believe there is a direct link between the advent of cooking, the shortening of human intestinal tract and the growth of the human brain. Since long, intestines and large brains are both massive energy consumers. It's hard to have both. By shortening the intestines and decreasing their energy consumption, cooking inadvertently opened the way to the jumbo brains of Neanderthals and sapiens. Fire also opened the first significant gulf between man and the other animals. The power of almost all animals depends on their bodies, the strength of their muscles, the size of their teeth, the breadth of their wings. Though they may harness winds and currents, they are unable to control these natural forces and are always constrained by the physical design. Eagles, for example, identify thermal columns rising from the ground spread their giant wings and allow the hot air to lift them upward. Yet eagles cannot control the location of the columns and their maximum carrying capacity is strictly proportional to their wingspan. When humans domesticated fire, they gained control of an obedient and potentially limitless force. Unlike eagles, humans could choose when and where to ignite a flame and they were able to exploit fire for any number of tasks. More importantly, the power of fire was not limited by the form, structure or strength of the human body. A single woman with a flint or fire stick could burn down an entire forest in a matter of hours. The domestication of fire was a sign of things to come.
Despite the benefits of fire, 150,000 years ago humans were still marginal creatures. They could now scare away lions, warm themselves during cold nights and burn down the occasional forest. Yet counting all species together, there were still no more than perhaps a million humans living between the Indonesian archipelago and the Iberian Peninsula. A mere blip on the ecological radar. Our own species, Homo sapiens, were already present on the world stage, but so far it was just minding its own business in a corner of Africa. We don't know exactly where and when animals that can be classified as Homo sapiens first evolved from some earlier type of humans, but most scientists agree that by 150,000 years ago, East Africa was populated by sapiens. It looked just like us. If one of them turned up in a modern morgue, the local pathologist would notice nothing peculiar. Thanks to the blessings of fire, they had smaller teeth and jaws than their ancestors, whereas they had massive brains equal in size to ours. Scientists also agree that about 70,000 years ago, sapiens from East Africa spread into the Arabian Peninsula and from there they quickly overran the entire Eurasian landmass. When Homo sapiens landed in Arabia, most of Eurasia was already settled by other humans. What happened to them? There are two conflicting theories. The interbreeding theory tells a story of attraction, sex and mingling. As the African immigrants spread around the world, they bred with other humans' population and people today are the outcome of this interbreeding. For example, when sapiens reached the Middle East and Europe, they encountered the Neanderthals. These humans were more muscular than sapiens, had larger brains and were better adapted to cold climes. They used tools and fires, were good hunters, apparently took care of their stick and infirm. Archaeologists have discovered the bones of Neanderthals who lived for many years and severe physical handicaps evidence that they were cared for by their relatives. Neanderthals are often depicted in caricatures as the archetypical, brutish and stupid cave people but recent evidence has changed their image. According to the interbreeding theory, when sapiens spread into Neanderthal lands, sapiens bred with Neanderthals until the two populations merged. If this is the case, then today's Eurasians are not pure sapiens. They are a mixture of sapiens and Neanderthals. Similarly, when sapiens reached East Asia, they interbred with the local erectus, so the Chinese and Koreans are a mixture of sapiens and erectus. The opposing view called the replacement theory tells a very different story, one of incompatibility, revulsion and perhaps even genocide. According to this theory, sapiens and other humans had different anatomies and most likely different mating habits and even body odors. They would have had little sexual interest in one another and in even if a Neanderthal Romeo and a sapiens Juliet fell in love, they could not produce fertile children because the genetic gulf separating the two populations was already unbridgeable. The two populations remained completely distinct and when the Neanderthals died out or were killed off, their genes died with them. According to this view, sapiens replaced all the previous human populations without merging with them. If that is the case, the lineages of all contemporary humans can be traced back exclusively to East Africa 70,000 years ago. We are all pure Sapiens. A lot hinges on this debate. 
from an evolutionary perspective 70,000 years is a relatively short interval. If the replacement theory is correct, all living humans have roughly the same genetic baggage and racial distinctions among them are negligible. But if the interbreeding theory is right, there might well be genetic differences between Africans, Europeans and Asians that go back hundreds of thousands of years. This is political dynamite which could provide material for explosive racial theories. In recent decades, the replacement theory has been the common wisdom in the field. It had firmer archaeological backing and was more politically correct. Scientists had no desire to open up the Pandora box of racism by claiming significant genetic diversity among modern human populations. But that ended in 2010, when the results of a 40-year effort to map the Neanderthal genome were published. Genetic were able to collect enough intact Neanderthal DNA from fossils to make a broad comparison between it and the DNA of contemporary humans. The results stunned the scientific community. It turned out that 1-4% to 4 of the unique human DNA of modern populations in the Middle East and Europe is Neanderthal DNA. That's not a huge amount, but it's significant. A second shock came several months later, when DNA extracted from the fossilized finger from Denisova was mapped. The result proved that up to 6% of the unique human DNA of modern millenniations and aboriginal Australians is Denisovan DNA. If these results are valid, and it's important to keep in mind that further research is underway and may either reinforce or modify these conclusions, the interbreeders got at least some things right. But that doesn't mean that the replacement theory is completely wrong. Since Neanderthals and Denisovans contributed only a small amount of DNA to our present day genome, it is impossible to speak of a merger between sapiens and other human species. Although differences between them were not large enough to completely prevent fertile intercourse, they were sufficient to make such contacts very rare. How then should we understand the biological relatedness of sapiens? Neanderthals and Denisovans, clearly they were not completely different species like horses and donkeys. On the other hand, they were not just different populations of the same species like bulldog and spaniels. Biological reality is not black and white. There are some important gray areas. Every two species that evolved from a common ancestor such as horses and donkeys were at one time just two populations of the same species like bulldog and spaniels. There must have been a point when the two populations were already quite different from one another but still capable on rare occasions of having sex and producing fertile offspring. Then another mutation severed this last connecting thread and they went their separate evolutionary ways. It seems that about 50,000 years ago, sapiens, Neanderthals and Denisovans were at that borderline point. They were almost but not quite entirely separate species as we shall see in the next chapter. Sapiens were already very different from Neanderthals and Denisovans not only in their genetic code and physical traits but also in their cognitive and social abilities. Yet it appears it was still just possible on rare occasions for sapiens and Neanderthals to produce a fertile offspring. So the populations did not merge but a few lucky Neanderthals genes did hitch a ridge on the sapiens express. It is unsettling and perhaps thrilling. 
to think that we sapiens could at one time have sex with an animal from a different species and produce children together. But if the Neanderthals, Denisovans and other human species did not merge with sapiens, why did they vanish? One possibility is that Homo sapiens drove them to extinction. Imagine a sapiens band reaching a Balkan valley where Neanderthals had lived for hundreds of thousands of years. The newcomers began to hunt the deer and gather the nuts and berries that were the Neanderthals' traditional staples. Sapiens were more proficient hunters and gatherers, thanks to better technology and superior social skills. So they multiplied and spread. The less resourceful Neanderthals found it increasingly difficult to feed themselves. The newcomers began to hunt the deer and gather the nuts and berries that were the Neanderthals' traditional staples. Sapiens were more proficient hunters and gatherers, thanks to better technology and superior social skills. So they multiplied and spread. The less resourceful Neanderthals found it increasingly difficult to feed themselves. Their population dwindled and they slowly died out, except perhaps for one or two members who joined their sapien neighbors. Another possibility is that competition for resources flared up into violence and genocide. Tolerance is not a sapien trademark. In modern times, a small difference in skin, color, dialect, or religion has been enough to prompt one group of sapiens to set about exterminating another group. Would ancient sapiens have been more tolerant towards an entirely different human species? It may well be then that when sapiens encountered Neanderthals, the result was the first and most significant ethnic cleansing campaign in history. Whichever way it happened, the Neanderthals and the other human species pose one of history's great what-ifs. Imagine how things might have turned out had the Neanderthals or Denisovans survived alongside Homo sapiens. What kind of cultures, societies and political structures would have emerged in a world where several different human species coexisted? How, for example, would religious fates have unfolded? Would the book of Genesis have declared that Neanderthals descend from Adam and Eve? Would Jesus have died for the sins of the Denisovans? And would the Quran have reserved seats in heaven for all righteous humans? Whatever their species, would Neanderthals have been able to serve in Roman legends or in the sprawling bureaucracy of imperial China? Would the American Declaration of Independence hold as a self-evident truth that all members of the genus Homo are created equal? Would Karl Marx have urged workers of all species to unite? Over the past 100,000 years ago, Homo sapiens have grown so accustomed to being the only human species that it's hard for us to conceive of any other possibility. Our lack of brothers and sisters makes it easier to imagine that we are the epitome of creation and that a charge separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. When Charles Darwin indicated that Homo sapiens was just another kind of animal, people were outraged. Even today many refuse to believe it. Had the Neanderthal survived, would we still imagine ourselves to be a creature apart? Perhaps this is exactly why our ancestor wiped out the Neanderthals. They were too familiar to ignore but too different to tolerate. Whether sapiens are to blame or not, no sooner had they arrived at a new location than the native population became extinct. The last remains of Homo solanesis are dated about 50,000 years ago. Homo Denisova disappeared shortly thereafter. Neanderthals made their exit roughly 30,000 years ago. The last dwarf like human vanished from Flores Island about 12,000 years ago. They left behind some bones, stone tools, a few genes in our DNA, and a lot of unanswered questions. They also left behind us Homo sapiens, the last human species. What was the sapiens secret of success? How did we manage to settle so rapidly in so many distant and ecologically different habitats? 
how did we push all other human species into oblivion why couldn't even the strong brainy cold proof nandathal survive our onslaught the debate continues to rage the most likely answer is the very thing that makes the debate possible homo sapiens conquered the world thanks above all to its unique language in the previous chapter we saw that all the sapiens had already populated east africa 150000 years ago they began to overrun the rest of planet earth and drive the other human species to extinction only about 70000 years ago in the intervening millennia even though these archaic sapiens looked just like us and their brains were as big as ours they did not enjoy any marked advantage over other human species did not produce particularly sophisticated tools and did not accomplish any other special feats in fact in the first recorded encounter between sapiens and the neanderthals the neanderthals won about 100000 years ago some sapiens group migrated north to the levant which was neanderthal territory but failed to secure a firm footing it might have been due to nasty natives an inclement climate or unfamiliar local parasites whatever the reasons the sapiens eventually retreated leaving the neanderthals as master of the middle east this poor record of achievement has led scholars to speculate that the internal structure of the brains of the sapiens was probably different from ours they looked like us but their cognitive abilities learning remembering communicating were far from limited teaching such an ancient sapiens english persuading him of the truth christian dogma or getting him to understand the theory of evolution would probably have been hopeless undertakings conversely we would have had a very hard time learning his language and understanding his way of thinking but then beginning about 70000 years ago homo sapiens started doing very special things around that date sapiens bands left africa for a second time this time they drove the neanderthals and all other human species not only from the middle east but from the face of the earth within a remarkably short period sapiens reached europe and east asia About 45,000 years ago they somehow crossed the open sea and landed in Australia a continent hitherto untouched by humans the period from about 70,000 years ago to about 30,000 years ago witnessed the invention of boats oil lamps bows and arrows and needless essential for swing warm clothing the first objects that can reliably be called art date from this era as does the first clear evidence for religion commerce and social stratification most researchers believe that these unprecedented accomplishments were the product of a revolution in sapiens cognitive abilities They maintained that the people who drove the Neanderthals to extinction settled Australia and carved the statue line man were as intelligent, creative and sensitive as we are. If we were to come across the artists of the statue cave we could learn their language and their ours. We would be able to explain to them everything we know from the adventures of Alice in Wonderland to the paradoxes of the quantum physics and they could teach us how their people view the world the appearance of new ways of thinking and communicating between 70000 and 30000 years ago constitutes the cognitive revolution what caused it we are not sure the most commonly believed theory argues that accidental genetic mutations changed the inner writings of the brain of sapiens enabling them to think in unprecedented ways and to communicate using an altogether new type of language we might call it the tree of knowledge 
why did it occur in sapiens dna rather than in that of neanderthals it was a matter of pure chance as far as we can tell but it was important to understand the consequences of the tree of knowledge mutations that it causes what was so special about the new sapiens language that it enabled us to conquer the world it was not the first language every animal has some kind of language even insects such as bees and ants know how to communicate in sophisticated ways informing one another of the whereabouts of food neither was it the first vocal language many animal including all ape and monkey species have vocal languages for example green monkeys use calls of various kinds no communicate zoologists have identified one call that means careful an eagle a slightly different call warns careful a lion when researchers played a recording of the first call to a group of monkeys the monkeys stopped what they were doing and looked upward in fear when the same group heard a recording of the second call the lion warning they quickly scrambled up a tree sapiens can produce many more distinct sounds than green monkeys but whales and elephants have equally impressive abilities a parrot can say anything albert einstein could say as well as mimicking the sounds of phones ringing doors slamming and sirens wailing whatever advantage einstein had over a parrot it wasn't vocal what then is so special about our language the most common answer is that our language is amazingly supple we can connect a limited number of sounds and signs to produce an infinite number of sentences each with a distinct meaning we can thereby ingest store and communicate a prodigious amount of information about this surrounding world a green monkey can yell to its comrades careful a lion but a modern human can tell her friend that this morning near the bend in the river she saw a lion tracking a herd of bison she can then describe the exact location including the different paths leading to the area with this information the members of her band can put their heads together and discuss whether they should approach the river chase away the lion and hunt the bison a second theory agrees that our unique language evolved as a means of sharing information about the world but the most important information that needed to be conveyed was about humans not about lions and bison our language evolved as a way of gossiping according to this theory homo sapiens is primarily a social animal social cooperation is our key for survival and reproduction it is not enough for an individual man and woman to know the whereabouts of lion and bison it's much more important for them to know who in their band hates whom who is sleeping with whom who is honest and who is a cheat the amount of information that one must obtain and store in order to track the ever changing relationship of even a few dozen individuals is staggering in a band of 15 individuals there are 1225 one on one a relationship and countless more complex social combinations all apes show a keen interest in such a social information but they have a terrible gossiping effectively neanderthals and archaic homo sapiens probably also had a hard time talking behind each other's back a much maligned ability which is in fact essential for cooperation in large numbers the new linguistic skills that modern sapiens acquired about 70 millennia ago enabled them to gossip for hours on end reliable information about who could be trusted meant that small bands could expand into larger bands and sapiens could develop tighter and more sophisticated types of cooperation the gossip theory might sound like a joke but numerous studies support it even today the vast majority of human communication whether in the form of email phone calls or newspaper columns is gossip 
It comes so naturally to us that it seems as if our language evolved for this very purpose. Do you think that history professors chat about the reasons for the First World War when they meet for lunch? Or that nuclear physicists spend their coffee breaks at scientific conferences talking about quarks? Sometimes, but more often, they gossip about the professor who caught her husband cheating, or the quarrel between the head of the department and the dean, or the rumors that a colleague used his research funds to buy a Lexus. Gossip usually focus on wrongdoings. Rumor monger are the original fourth estate. Journalists who inform society about and thus protect it from cheats and freeloaders. Most likely both the gossip theory and there is a line near the river theory are valid. Yet the truly unique feature of our language is not its ability to transmit information about men and lines, rather it is the ability to transmit information about things that do not exist at all. As far as we know, only sapiens can talk about entire kinds of entities that they have never seen, touched or smelled. Legends, myths, gods and religions appear for the first time with the cognitive revolution. Many animals and human species could previously care, say careful a lion, thanks to the cognitive revolution. Homo sapiens acquired the ability to say the lion is the guardian spirit of our tribe. This ability to speak about fictions is the most unique feature of sapiens language. It's relatively easy to agree that only homo sapiens can speak about things that don't really exist. They believe six impossible things before breakfast. You could never convince a monkey to give you a banana by promising him limitless bananas after death in monkey heaven. But why it is important? After all, fiction can be dangerously misleading or distracting. People who go to the forest looking for fairies and unicorns would seem to have less chance of survival than people who go looking for mushrooms and deer. And if you spend hours praying to non-existing guardian spirits, aren't you wasting precious time? Time better spent foraging, fighting and fornicating. But fiction has enabled us not merely to imagine things but to do so collectively. We can wave common myths such as the biblical creation story, the dream time myths of Aboriginal Australians and the nationalist myths of modern states. Such myths give Papians the unprecedented ability to cooperate flexible in large numbers. Ants and bees can also work together in huge numbers, but they do so in a very rigid manner and only with close relatives. Wolves and chimpanzees cooperate far more flexibly than ants, but they could do only with small numbers of other individuals that they know intimately. Sapiens can cooperate in extreme flexible ways with countless numbers of strangers that's why sapiens rule the world whereas ants ears out leftovers and chimps are locked up in zoos and research laboratories the legend of Pujo our chimpanzee cousins usually live in small troops of several dozen individuals. They form close friendships, hunt together and fight shoulder to shoulder against baboons, cheetahs and enemy chimpanzees. The social structure tends to be hierarchical. The dominant member, who is almost always a male, is termed the alpha male. Other males and females exhibit their submission to the alpha male by bowing before him while making grunting sounds not unlike human subjects before a king. The alpha male strives to maintain social harmony within his troop. When two individuals fight, he will intervene and stop the violence. Less benevolently, he might monopolize particularly coveted foods and prevent 
low-ranking males from mating with the females. When two males are contesting the alpha position, they usually do so by forming extensive coalitions of supporters, both male and female, from within the group. Ties between coalition members are based on intimate daily contact, hugging, touching, kissing, grooming, and mutual favors. Just as human politicians on election campaigns go around shaking hands and kissing babies, so aspirants to the top position in chimpanzee group spend much time hugging, back slapping, and kissing baby chimps. The alpha male usually wins his position not because he is physically stronger, but because he leads a large and stable coalition. These coalitions play a central part not only during overt struggles for the alpha position, but in almost all day-to-day -day activities. Members of a coalition spend more time together, share food and help one another in times of trouble. There are clear limits to the size of the groups that can be formed and maintained in such a way. In order to function, all members of a group must know each other intimately. Two chimpanzees who have never met, never fought and never engaged in mutual grooming will know know whether they can trust one another, whether it would be worthwhile to help one another and when one of them ranks higher. Under natural conditions, a typical chimpanzee's troop consists of about 20 to 50 individuals. As the number of chimpanzees in a troop increases, the social order destabilizes eventually leading to a rupture and the formation of a new troop by some of the animals. Only in a handful of cases have zoologists observed groups larger than a hundred. Separate groups seldom cooperate and tend to compete for territory and food. Researchers have documented prolonged warfare between groups and even one case of genocidal activity in which one troop systematically slaughtered most members of a neighboring band. The ability to create an imagined reality out of words enabled large numbers of strangers to cooperate effectively. But it also did something more. Since large-scale human cooperation is based on myths, the way people cooperate can be altered by changing the myths, by telling different stories. Under the right circumstances, myths can change rapidly. In 1789, the French population switched almost overnight from believing in the myth of the divine right of kings to believing in the myth of the sovereignty of the people. Consequently, ever since the cognitive revolution, Homo sapiens has been able to revise its behavior rapidly in accordance with changing needs. This opened a fast lane of cultural evolution. Bypassing the traffic jams of genetic evolution, speeding down this fast lane, Homo sapiens soon far outstripped all other human and animal species in its ability to cooperate. The behavior of other social animals is determined to a large extent by their genes. DNA is not an autocrat. Animal behavior is also influenced by environmental factors and individual quirks. Nevertheless, in a given environment, animals of the some species will tend to behave in a similar way. Significant changes in social behavior cannot occur in general without genetic mutations. For example, common chimpanzees have a generic mutations. For example, common chimpanzees have a genetic tendency to live in hierarchical groups headed by an alpha male. Members of a closely related chimpanzees species bonobos usually live in more egalitarian groups dominated by female alliances. Female common chimpanzees cannot take lessons from their bonobo relatives and stage a feminist revolution. Male chimps cannot gather a constitutional assembly to abolish the office of alpha male and declare that from here on out all chimps are to be treated as equals. Such dramatic changes in behavior would occur only if something changed in the chimpanzee's DNA. 
For similar reasons, archaic humans did not initiate any revolution. As far as we can tell, changes in social patterns, the invention of new technologies, and the settlement of alien habitats resulted from genetic mutations and environmental pressures more than from cultural initiatives. This is why it took human hundreds of thousands of years to make these steps. Two million years ago, genetic mutations resulted in the appearance of a new human species called Homo erectus. Its emergence was accompanied by a development of a new stone tool technology now recognized as a defining feature of this species. As long as Homo erectus did not undergo further genetic alterations, its stone tools remained roughly the same for close to 2 million years. In contrast, ever since the cognitive revolution, sapiens have been able to change their behavior quickly, transmitting new behaviors to future generations without any need of genetic or environmental changes. As a prime example, consider the repeated appearance of childless elites, such as the Catholic priesthood, Buddhist monastic orders, and Chinese eunuch bureaucracies. The existence of such elites goes against the most fundamental principle of natural selection. Since these dominant members of society willingly give up procreation, whereas chimpanzees alpha males use their power to have sex with as many females as possible, and consequently serve a large proportion of their troops young. The Catholic alpha male abstains completely from sexual intercourse and child care. This abstinence does not result from unique environmental conditions such as severe lack of food or want of potential mates, nor is it the result of some quirky genetic mutations. The Catholic Church has survived for centuries not by passing on a celibacy gene from one pope to the next but by passing on the stories of the New Testament and of Catholic canon law. In other words, while the behavior patterns of archaic humans remained fixed for tens of thousands of years, sapiens could transform their social structures, the nature of their interpersonal relations, their economic activities, and a host of other behaviors within a decade or two. Consider a resident of Berlin, born in 1900 and living to the ripe age of 100, she spent her childhood in the Hohenzollern Empire of Wilhelm II. Her adult years in the Weimar Republic, the Nazi Third Reich, and Communist East Germany, and she died a citizen of a democratic and reunified Germany. She had managed to be part of five very different socio-political systems through her DNA remained exactly the same. This was the key of Sapien's success. In a one-on-one -on -one brawl, a Neanderthal would probably have been a Sapiens. But in a conflict of hundreds, Neanderthals wouldn't stand a chance. Neanderthals could share information about the whereabouts of lion, but they probably could not tell and revise stories about tribal spirits without an ability to compose fiction. Neanderthals were unable to cooperate effectively in large numbers, nor could they adopt their social behavior to rapidly changing challenges. While we can't get inside a Neanderthal mind to understand how they thought, we have an indirect evidence of the limits of their cognitive compared with their sapiens rivals. Archaeologists excavating 30,000 years old sapiens sites in the European heartland occasionally find their seashells from the Mediterranean and Atlantic coasts. In all likelihood, these shells got to continental interior through long distance trade between different sapiens bands. Neanderthals sites lack any evidence of such trade. Each group manufactured its own tools from local materials. Another example comes from the South Pacific. Sapiens bands that lived on the island of the New Ireland, north of New Guinea, used a volcanic glass called obsidian to manufacture particularly strong and sharp tools. New Ireland, however, has no natural deposits of obsidian. Laboratory tests revealed that the obsidian they used was brought from deposits on New Britain, an island 400 kilometers away. Some of the inhabitants of these islands must have been skilled navigators who traded from island to island over long distances. Trade may seem a very pragmatic activity, one that seeds no fictive basis. Yet the fact is that no animal other than sapiens in graves in 
trade and all the sapiens trade network about which we have detailed evidence were based on fictions. Trade cannot exist without trust and it is very difficult to trust strangers. The global network of trade of today is based on our trust is such fictional entities as the dollar, the Federal Reserve Bank and the totemic trademarks of corporations. When two strangers in a tribal society want to trade, they will often establish trust by appealing on common god, mythical ancestors, or totem animals. If archaic sapiens believing in such fictions traded shells and obsidian, it stands to reason that they could also have traded information, thus creating a much denser and wider knowledge network than the one that served Neanderthals and other archaic humans. Hunting techniques provide another illustration of these differences. Neanderthals usually hunted alone or in a small groups. Sapiens, on the other hand, developed techniques that relied on cooperation between many dozens of individuals and perhaps even between different bands. One particularly effective method was to surround an entire herd of animals, such as wild horses, then chase them into a narrow gorge, where it was easy to slaughter them in mass. If all went according to plan, the bands could harvest tons of meat, fat, and animal skins in a single afternoon of collective effort and either consume these riches in a giant pot latch or dry smoke or in arctic areas freeze them for later usage. Archaeologists have discovered sites where entire herds were butchered annually in such ways. There are even sites where fences and obstacles were erected in order to create artificial traps and slaughtering grounds. We may presume that Neanderthals were not pleased to see their traditional hunting grounds turned into sapiens-controlled slaughterhouses. However, if violence broke out between the two species, Neanderthals were not much better off than wild horses. Fifty Neanderthals cooperating in traditional and static patterns were no match for 500 versatile of innovative sapiens. And even if the sapiens lost the first round, they could quickly invent new segments and stratagems that would enable them to win the next time. The immense diversity of imagined realities that sapiens invented and the resulting diversity of behavior patterns are the main components of what we'll call cultures. Once cultures appear, they never cease to change and develop and these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. The cognitive revolution is accordingly to the point when history declared its independence from biology. Until the cognitive revolution, the doings of all human species belong to the realm of biology or if you so prefer, prehistory. From the cognitive revolution onwards, historical narratives replaces biological theories as our primary means of explaining the development of Homo sapiens. To understand the rise of Christianity or the French Revolution, it is not enough to comprehend the interactions of genes, hormones, or organisms it is necessary to take into account the interactions of ideas, images, and fantasies as well. This does not mean that Homo sapiens and human culture became exempt from biological laws. We are still animal and our physical, emotional, and cognitive abilities are still shaped by our DNA. Our societies are built from the same building blocks as Neanderthals or chimpanzee society and the more we examine these building blocks, sensations, emotions, family ties, the less difference we find between us and other apes. It is however a mistake to look for the differences at the level of the individual or the family. One on one, even ten on ten, we are embracingly similar to chimpanzees. Significant differences begin to appear only when we cross the threshold of 150 individuals and when we reach 1,000 to 2,000 individuals, the differences are outstanding. If you try to bunch together thousands of chimpanzees into a Tiananmen Square, Wall Street, the Vatican, or the headquarters of the United Nations, the result would be pandemonium. By contrast, sapiens regularly gather by thousands in such places. Together, they create orderly patterns such as trade networks, mass celebrations, and political institutions that they could never have created in isolation. The real difference between us and the chimpanzees in the mythical glue that binds together large number of individuals, families, and groups. This glue has made us the master of creation. 
Of course, you also need other skills, such as the ability to make the use tools. Yet, tool making is of little consequence unless it is coupled with the ability to cooperate with other many. How is it that we now have intercontinental missiles with nuclear warheads, whereas 30,000 years ago we had only a stick with a flint spear heads? Physiologically, that has been no significant improvement in our tool making capacity over the last 30,000 years. Albert Einstein was far less dexterous with his hands than was an ancient hunt gatherer. However, our capacity to cooperate with large numbers of strangers has improved dramatically. The ancient flint spearhead was manufactured in minutes by a single person who relied on the advice and help of a few intimate friends. The production of a new modern nuclear warhead requires the cooperation of millions of strangers all over the world, from the workers who mine the uranium ore in the depths of the earth to theoretical physicists who write long mathematical formulae to describe the interactions of subatomic particles. To summarize the relationships between the biology and history after the cognitive revolution. Number A. Biology sets the basic parameters for the behavior and capacities for Homo sapiens. The whole of history takes place within the bounds of this biological arena. Number B. However, this arena is extraordinarily large, allowing sapiens to play an astounding variety of games. Thanks to their ability to invent fiction, sapiens create more and more complex games which each generation develop and elaborates even further. Consequently, in order to understand how sapiens behave, we must describe the historical evolution of their actions. Referring only to our biological constraints would be like a radio sports caster who, attending the World Cup football championships, offers his listeners a detailed description of the playing field rather than the account of what he players are doing. What games did our Stone Age ancestors play in the arena of history? As far as we know, the people who carved the steady lion Mayan some 30,000 years ago had the same physical, emotional and intellectual abilities we have. What did they do when they woke up in the morning? What did they eat for breakfast and lunch? What were their societies like? Did they have monogamous relationship and nuclear families? Did they have ceremonies, moral codes, sports, contests, and religious rituals? Did they fight wars? The next chapter takes a peek behind the curtain of the ages examining what life was like in the millennia separating the cognitive revolution from the agriculture revolution. To understand our nature, history and psychology, we must get inside the head of our hunter-gatherers ancestors. For nearly the entire history of our species, sapiens lived as foragers. The past 2000 years, during which our increasing numbers of sapiens have obtained their daily bread as urban laborers and office workers, and the preceding 10,000 years, during which most sapiens lived as farmers and herders, are the blink of an eye compared to the tens of thousands of years during which our ancestors hunted and gathered. The flourishing field of evolutionary psychology argues that many of our present-day social and psychological characteristics were shaped during this long pre-agricultural era. Even today, scholars in this field claim our brains and minds are adopted to a life of hunting-gathering. Our eating habits, our conflicts, and our sexuality are all the results of the way our hunter-gatherer minds interact with our current post-industrial environment, with its megacities, aeroplanes, telephones, and computers. This environment gives us more material resources and longer life than those enjoyed by any previous generation, but it often makes us feel alienated, depressed, and pressured. To understand why evolutionary psychologists argue we need to delve into the hunter-gatherer world that shaped us, the world that we subconsciously still inhabit. Why? For example, do people gorge on high-calorie food that is doing little good to their bodies? Today's affluent societies are in the throes of a plague of obesity, which is rapidly spreading to developing countries. It's a puzzle. Why we binge into the sweetest and the greasiest food we can't find until we consider the eating habits of our forager for beers. 
In the savannas and the forests they inhabited, high calorie sweets were extremely rare and food general was in short supply. A typical forager 30,000 years ago had access to only one type of sweet food, or ripe fruit. If a stone aged woman came across a tree groaning with figs, the most sensible thing to do was to eat as many of them as she could not on the spot. Before the local baboon band picked the tree bare, the instinct to gorge on high calorie food was hardwired into our genes. Today we may be living in high rise apartments with our stuffed refrigerators, but our DNA still thinks we are in the savannas. That's what makes us spoon down an entire tub of Ben and Jerry when we find one in the freezer and wash it down with the jumbo coke. This gorging gene theory is widely accepted. Our theories are far more contentious. For example, some evolutionary psychologists argue that ancient foraging bands were not composed of nuclear families centered on monogamous couples. Rather, foragers believed in communes devoid of private property, monogamous relationships and even for fatherhood. In such a band, a woman could have sex and form intimate bonds with several men and women simultaneously, and all of the band's adults cooperated in parenting its children. Since no man knew definitively which of the children were his, men showed equal concern for all youngsters. Such a social structure is not an Aquarian utopia. It's well documented among animals, notably our closest relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos. There are even a number of present-day human cultures in which collective fatherhood is practiced, as for example among the Bari Indians. According to the beliefs of such societies, a child is not born from the sperm of a single man, but from the accumulation of a sperm in a woman, womb. A good mother will make a point of having sex with several different men, especially when she is pregnant so that her child will enjoy the qualities and paternal care, not merely of the best hunter, but also of the best storyteller, the strongest warrior, and the most considerate lover. If this sounds silly, Bear in mind that before the development of modern embryological studies, people had no solid evidence that babies are always sired by a single father rather than by many. The proponents of this ancient commune theory argue that the frequent infidelities that characterize modern marriages and the high rates of divorce, not to mention the cornucopia of psychological complexes from which both children and adults suffer all results from forcing humans to live in nuclear families of monogamous relationships that are incompatible with our biological software. Many scholars vehemently reject this theory, insisting that both monogamy and the forming of nuclear families are the core human behaviors, though ancient hunter-gatherer societies tended to be more communal and agilitarian than modern societies. These researchers argued they were nevertheless comprised of separate cells, each containing a jealous couple and the children they held in common. This is why today monogamous relationships and nuclear families are the norm in the vast majority of cultures. Why men and women tend to be very possessive of their partners and children. And why even in modern states such as North Korea and Syria, political authority passes from father to son. In order to resolve this controversy and understand our sexuality, society and politics, we need to learn something about the living conditions of our ancestors. To examine how sapiens lived between the cognitive revolution of 70,000 years ago and the start of the agricultural revolution about 12,000 years ago. Unfortunately, there are few certainties regarding the lives of our forager ancestors. The debate between the ancient commune and the eternal monogamy schools is based on flimsy evidence. We obviously have no written records from the age of foragers, and the archaeological evidence consists mainly of fossilized bones and stone tools. Artifacts made of more perishable materials such as wood, bamboo or leather survive only under unique conditions. The common impression that pre-agricultural humans lived in an age of stone is a misconception based on this archaeological bias. The stone age should more accurately be called the wood age because most of the tools used by ancient hunter-gatherers were made of wood. Any reconstruction of the lives of ancient hunter-gatherers from the surviving artifacts is extremely problematic. One of the most glaring differences between the ancient foragers and their agriculture and industrial dissidents 
is that foragers had very few artifacts to begin with, and these played a comparatively modest role in their lives. Over the course of his or her life, a typical member of a modern affluent society will own several million artifacts, from cars and houses to disposable nappies and milk cartons. There is hardly an activity, a belief, or even an emotion that is uh, not mediated by objects of our own devising. Our eating habits are mediated by a mind-boggling collection of such items, from spoons and glasses to genetic engineering labs and gigantic ocean-going ships. In play, we use a plethora of toys, from plastic cards to 100,000 seater stadiums. Our romantic and sexual relations are accounted by rings, beds, nice clothes, sexy underwears, condoms, fashionable restaurants, cheap motels, airport lounges, wedding halls, and catering companies. Religions Religions bring the sacred into our lives with Gothic churches, Muslim mosques, Hindu ashrams, Torah scrolls, Tibetan prayer wheels, priestly cassocks, candles, incense, Christmas tree, Mazza balls, tombstones and icons. We hardly notice how ubiquitous our stuff is until we have to move it to a new house. Foragers move house every month, every week and sometimes even every day totting whatever they had on their backs. There were no moving companies, wagons or even pack animals to share the burden. They consequently had to make do with only the most important essential possessions. It's reasonable to presume then that the greater part of their mental, religious and emotional lives was conducted without the help of artifacts. The archaeologists working 100,000 years from now could piece together a reasonable picture of Muslim belief and practice from the myriad objects he unearthed in a ruined mosque. But we are largely at a loss in trying to comprehend the belief and ritual of ancient hunter-gatherers. It's much the same the dilemma for a future historian would face if he had to depict the social world of 21st century teenagers solely on the belief of their surviving snail mail. Since no record will remain of their phone conversations, emails, blogs and text messages, our reliance on artifacts will thus bias an account of ancient hunter-gatherer life. One way to remedy this is to look at modern forager societies. These can be studied directly by anthropological observation. But there are good reasons to be very careful in extrapolating from made modern forager societies to ancient ones. Firstly, all forager societies that have survived into the modern era have been influenced by neighboring agricultural and industrial societies. Consequently, it's risky to assume that what is true of them was also true tens of thousands of years ago. Secondly, Modern forager societies have survived mainly in the areas with difficult climatic conditions and inhospitable terrain, ill-suited for agriculture. Societies that have adapted to the extreme conditions of places such as Kalahari Desert in southern Africa may have well provide a very misleading model for understanding ancient societies in fertile areas such as Yangtze River Valley. In particular, population density in an area like the Kalahari Desert is far lower than it was around the ancient Yangtze. And this has far-reaching implications for key questions about the size and structure of human bands and the relations between them. Thirdly, the most notable characteristics of hunter-gatherer societies is how different they are one from the other. They differ not only from one part of the world to another but even in the same region. One good example is a huge variety the first European settlers found among the Aborigin people of Australia. Just before the British conquest, between 300,000 and 700,000 hunter-gatherers lived on the continent in 200 and 600 tribes, each of which was further divided into several bands. Each tribe had its own language, religion, norms and customs, living around what is now Adelaide in southern Australia, where several par partly lineal clans that reckon does sent from the father's side. These clans bonded together into tribes on a strictly territorial basis. In contrast, some tribes in northern Australia gave more importance to a person's maternal ancestry and a person's tribal identity dependent on his or her totem 
rather than his territory. It stands to reason that the ethnic and cultural variety among ancient hunter-gatherers was equally impressive and that the 5 million to 8 million foragers who populated the world on the eve of agricultural revolution were divided into thousands of separate tribes with thousands of different languages and cultures. This, after all, was one of the main legacies of the cognitive revolution. Thanks to the appearance of fiction, even people with the same genetic makeup who lived under similar ecological conditions were able to create very different imagined realities which manifested themselves in different norms and values. For example, there is every reason to believe that a forager band to they had lived 30,000 years ago on the spot where Oxford University now stands would have spoken a different language from one living where Cambridge is now situated. One band might have been belligerent and the other peaceful. Perhaps the Cambridge band was communal while the one at Oxford was based on nuclear families. The Cantabrigians might have spent long hours carving wooden statues of their guardian spirits, whereas the Oxonians have worshipped through dance. The former perhaps believed in reincarnation while the latter thought this was nonsense. In one society, homosexual relationships might have been accepted while in the other they were taboo. In other words, while anthropological observation of modern foragers can help us understand some of the possibilities available to ancient foragers, the ancient horizon of possibilities was much broader and most of it is hidden from our view. The heated debates about Homo sapiens' natural way of life miss the main point. Ever since the cognitive revolution, there hasn't been a single natural way of life for sapiens. There are only cultural choices from among the bewildering palette of possibilities. What generalization can we make about life in the pre-agricultural world nevertheless? It seems safe to say that the vast majority of people lived in small bands numbering several dozen or at most several hundred individuals and that all these individuals were humans. It is important to note this last point because it is far from obvious. Most members of ag agricultural and industrial societies are domesticated animals. They are not equal to their masters, of course, but they are members of the same society. Today the society called New Zealand is composed of 4.5 million sapiens and 50 million sheep. There was just one exception to this general rule, the dog. The dog was the first animal domesticated by Homo sapiens and this occurred before the agricultural revolution. Experts disagree about the exact date but we have incontrovertible evidence of domesticated dogs about 15,000 years ago. They may have joined the human pack thousands of years earlier. Dogs were used for hunting and fighting and as an alarm system against wild beasts and human intruders with the passing of generations the two species co-evolved to communicate well with each other. Dogs that were most attentive to the needs and feelings of their human companions got extra care and food and were more likely to survive. Simultaneously Dogs learned to manipulate people for their own needs. A 1500,000 years bond has yielded a much deeper understanding and affection between human and dogs than between humans and any other animal. In some cases, dead dogs were even buried ceremoniously, much like humans. Members of band knew each other very intimately and were surrounded throughout their lives by friends and relatives. Loneliness and privacy were rare. Neighboring bands probably competed for resources and even fought one another, but they also had friendly contacts. The exchange members hunted together rare, rare luxuries, cemented political alliances and celebrated religious festivals. Such cooperation was one of the important trademarks of Homo sapiens and gave it a crucial edge over other human species. Sometimes relations with neighboring bands were tight enough that together they constitute a single tribe, sharing a common language, common myths and common norms and values. Yes, we should not under overestimate the importance of such external relations. Even if it in times of crisis neighboring band drew closer together and even if they occasionally gather to hunt or feast together. They still spent the vast majority of their time in complete isolation and independence. 
trade was mostly limited to prestige items such as shells, amber, and pigment. There is no evidence that people traded staple goods like fruits and meats, or that the existence of one band depended on the importing of goods from another. Social political relations too tended to be sporadic. The tribe did not serve as a permanent political framework, and even if it had seasonal meeting places, there were no permanent towns or institutions. The average person lived many months without seeing or hearing a human from outside of her own band, and still encountered throughout her life no more than a few hundred humans. The sapiens population was thinly spread over vast territories. Before the agricultural revolution, the human population of the entire planet was smaller than that of today's Cairo. Most sapiens bands lived on the road, roaming from place to place in search of food. Their movement were influenced by the changing seasons, the annual migrations of animals and the growth cycles of plants. They usually traveled back and forth across the same home territory, an area of between several dozen and many hundreds of square kilometers. Occasionally, bands wandered outside their turf and explored new lands, whether due to natural calamities, violent conflicts, demographic pressures, or the initiative of charismatic leaders. These wanderings were the engine of human worldwide expansion. If a forager band split once every 40 years and its splinter group migrated to a new territory 100 kilometers to the east, the distance from East Africa to China would have been covered in about 10,000 years. In some international Cases when food sources were particularly rich, bands settled down in the seasonal and even permanent camps. Techniques for dyeing, smoking, and freezing food also made it possible to stay put for longer periods. More importantly, alongside seas and rivers rich in seafood and waterfall, humans set up permanent fishing villages. The first permanent settlements in history, long predating the agricultural revolution, fishing villages might have appeared on the coast of Indonesian islands as early as 45,000 years ago. This may have been the base from which Homo sapiens launched its first transoceanic enterprise, the invasion of Australia. In most habitats, sapiens bands fed themselves in an elastic and opportunistic fashion. They scrounged the termites, picked berries, dug for roots, stalked rabbits, and hunted bison and mammoth. Notwithstanding the popular image of man the hunter, gatherings were sapiens' main activity and it provided most of the calories as well as raw materials such as flint, wood, and bamboo. Sapiens did not forage for only for food and material, they foraged for knowledge as well. To survive, they needed a detailed mental map of their territory. To maximize the efficiency of their daily search for food, they required information about the growth patterns of each plant and the habitat of each animal. They needed to know which food were nourishing, which made you sick, and how to use others as cures. They needed to know the progress of the seasons and what warning signs preceded a thunderstorm or a dye spell. They studied every stream, every walnut tree, every bear cave, every flint stone deposited in their vicinity. Each individual had to understand how to make a stone knife, how to mend a turned cloak, how to lay a rabbit, trap, and how to face avalanches, snake bites, or hungry lions. Mastery of each of these many skills required years of apprenticeship and practice. The average ancient forager could turn a flint stone into a spear point within minutes. When we try to intimate this feat, we usually fail miserably. Most of us lack expert knowledge of the flaking properties of flint and basalt and the fine motor skills needed to work them precisely. In other words, the average forager had wider, deeper, and more varied knowledge of immediate surroundings than most of her modern descendants. Today, most people in industrial societies don't need to know much about the natural world in order to survive. What do you really need to know in order to get by a computer engineer, an insurance agent, a history teacher, or a factory worker? You need to know a lot about your own tiny field of expertise. But for the vast majorities of life's necessities, you rely blindly on the help of other experts, whose own knowledge is also limited to a tiny field of expertise. The human collective knows far more today than did the ancient bands, but at the individual level, ancient foragers were the most knowledgeable and skillful people in history. There is some evidence that the size of the average sapiens brains has actually decreased since the age of foraging. Survival in that era required super mental abilities from everyone. When agriculture and industry came along, people could increasingly rely on the scales of the other for survival and new niches for imbeciles were opened up.
You could survive and pass your unremarkable genes to the next generation by working as a water carrier or an assembly line worker. Foragers master not only the surroundings world of animals, plants and objects but also the internal world of their own bodies and senses. They listen to the slightest movement in the grass to learn whether a snake might be lurking there. They carefully observe the foliage of trees in order to discover fruits, beehives and birds' nests. They move with the minimum of efforts and noise and knew how to sit, walk and run in the most agile and efficient manner. Varied and constant use of their bodies made them as fit as marathon runners. They had physical dexterity that people today are unable to achieve even after years of practicing yoga and tai chi. The hunter-gatherer way of life differed significantly from region to region and from season to season but on the whole, foragers seem to have enjoyed a more comfortable and rewarding lifestyle than most of the peasants, shepherds, laborers, office clerks who followed in their footsteps. While people in today's affluent societies work an average of 40 to 45 hours a week and people in developing world work 60 and 80 hours a week, hunter-gatherers living today in the most inhospitable of habitats such as the Kalahari Desert work on average for just 35 to 45 hours a week. They hunt only one day out of three and gathering takes up just three to six hours daily. In normal times, this is enough to feed the band. It may well that ancient hunter-gatherers living in zones more fertile than the Kalari Desert spent even less time obtaining food and raw materials. On top of that, foragers enjoyed a lighter load of household chores. They had no dishes to wash, no carpets to vacuum, no followers to polish, no nappies to change, and no bills to pay. The forager economy provided most people with more interesting lives than agriculture or industry do. Today, a Chinese factory hand leaves home around 7 in the morning, makes her way through polluted streets to a sweatshop, and there operates the same machine in the same day in day out for 10 long and mind-numbing hours, returning home around 7 in the evening in order to wash dishes and do the laundry. 30,000 years ago, a Chinese forager might leave camp with her companion at, say, 8 in the morning. They would roam the nearby forests and meadows, gathering mushrooms, digging up the edible roots, catching frogs, and occasionally running away from the tigers. By early afternoon, they were back at the camp to make lunch. They left them plenty of time to gossip, tell stories, play with the children, and just hang out. Of course, the tigers sometimes caught them or snake bite them, but on the other hand, they did not have to deal with automobile accidents and industrial population. In most places, and at most times, foraging provided ideal nutrition that is hardly surprising. This had been the human diet for hundreds of thousands of years, and the human body was well adapted to it. Evidence from fossilized skeletons indicates that ancient foragers were less likely to suffer from starvation or malnutrition, and were generally taller and healthier than their peasants' descendants. Average life expectancy was apparently just 30 to 40 years, but this was due largely due to the high incidence of child morality. Children who made it through the perilous first years had a good chance of reaching the age of 60 and some even made it to their 80s. Among modern foragers, 45 years old women can expect to live another 20 years and about 5-8% to 8 of the population is over 60. The foragers' secret of success which protected them from starvation and malnutrition was their very diet. Farmers tend to eat a very limited and unbalanced diet, especially in the predominant times. Most of the calories feeding an agricultural population came from a single crop, such as wheat, potatoes, or rice, that lacks some of the vitamins, minerals, and other nutritional material human needs. The typical peasants in the traditional China ate rice for breakfast, rice for lunch, and rice for dinner. If she was lucky, she could expect to eat the same on the following day. By contrast, ancient foragers regularly ate dozens of different foodstuffs. The peasants' ancient ancestors, the forager, may have eaten berries and mushrooms for breakfast fruits, snails, and turtle for lunch, and rabbit steak with the wild onions for dinner tomorrow's menu might have been completely different. This variety ensured that the ancient foragers received all the necessary nutrients. Furthermore, by not being dependent on any single kind of food, they were less liable to suffer when one particular source failed. Agricultural societies have ravaged by famine when drought, fire, or earthquake devastated the annual rice or potato crop. Foragers societies were hardly immune to the natural disaster and suffered from periods of want and hunger. But they were usually able to deal with such calamities more easily. If they had lost some of their staple foodstuffs, they could gather or hunt other species or move to a less affected area. Ancient foragers also suffered less from infectious diseases. Most of the infectious diseases that have plagued 
agricultural and industrial societies originated in domesticated animals and were transferred to humans only after the agricultural revolution. Ancient foragers who had domesticated only dogs were free of their scourges. Moreover, most people in agriculture and industrial societies lived in dense, unhygienic permanent settlements, ideal hotbeds for disease. Foragers roamed the land in small bands that could not sustain epidemics. The whole summer varied diet, the relatively short working week, uh, and the rarity of infectious diseases have led many experts to define pre agricultural forager societies as the original affluent societies. It would be a mistake, however, to analyze the lives of these ancients, though they lived better lives than most of the people in agriculture and industrial societies. Their world could still be harsh and unforgiving. Periods of want and hardship were not uncommon, child mortality was high, and the incident which could be minor today could easily become a death sentence. Most people probably enjoyed the close intimacy of the roaming band, but those unfortunates who incurred the hostility or mockery of the fellow band members probably suffered terribly. Modern foragers occasionally abandon and even kill old and disabled people who cannot keep up with the band. Unwanted babies and children may be slain, and there are even cases of religiously inspired human sacrifice. The eight people, hunter-gatherers who lived in the jungles of the Paraguay, until the 1960s, offer a glimpse into the radical side of the foraging. When a valued band member died, the ache customarily killed a little girl and buried the two together. Anthropologists who have interviewed the ache recorded a case in which a band abandoned a middle-aged man who fell sick and was unable to keep up with the others. He was left under a tree. Wilchers perched above him, expecting a hearty meal, but the man recuperated and walking briskly, he managed to rejoin the band. His body was covered with the bird's faces, so he was henceforth nicknamed Vulture Droppings. When an old ache woman became a burden to the rest of the band, one of the younger men would sneak behind her and kill her with an axe blow to the head. An ache man told the inquisitive anthropologist stories of his prime years in the jungle. I customarily killed old women. I used to kill many aunts. The women were afraid of me. Now here with the wise, I have become weak. Babies born without hair who were considered underdeveloped were killed immediately. One woman recalled that her first baby girl was killed because of the men in the band did not want another girl. On another occasion, a man killed a small boy because he was in a bad mood and the child was crying. Another child was buried alive because it was funny looking and other children laughed at it. We should be careful, though not to judge the ache too quickly. Anthropologists who live with them for years report that violence between adults were very rare. Both women and men were free to change partners at will, they smiled and laughed, constantly had no leadership hierarchy and generally shunned domineering people. They were extremely generous with their few possessions and were not obsessed with the success or wealth. The things they valued most in life were good social interactions and high quality of friendships. They viewed the killing of children, sick people and elderly as many people today view abortion as euthanasia. It should also be noted that the ache were hunted and killed without mercy by Pragian farmers. They knew to evade their enemies, probably caused the ache to adopt an exceptionally harsh attitude towards anyone who might become a liability to the band. The truth is, ache society, like every human society, were very complex. We should be aware of diminishing or idealizing it on the basis of superficial acquaintance. The ache were neither angels nor friends, they were humans. So too, were the ancient hunter-gatherers, talking ghosts. What can we say about the spiritual and mental life of the ancient hunter-gatherers? The basics of the forager economy can be reconstructed with some confidence based on the quantifiable and objective factors. For example, we can calculate how many calories per day a person needed in order to survive. How many calories were obtained a person from a kilogram? of walnuts, and how many walnuts could be gathered for a, a square kilometer of forest. With this data, we can make an educated guess about the relative importance of walnuts in their diet. But did they consider walnuts a delicacy or a humdrum staple? Did they believe that walnut trees were inhabited by spirits? Did they find walnut uh, leaves pretty? If a forager boy want to take a forager girl to a romantic spot, did she shade of a walnut tree suffice? The world of thought, belief, and feeling is by definition far more difficult to decipher. Most scholars agree that animistic beliefs were common among the ancient forager. Animism 
is the belief that almost every place, every animal, every plant, and every natural phenomena has awareness and feeling and can communicate directly with human. Thus, animists may believe that the big rock at the top of the hill has desires and needs. The rock might be angry about something that people did and rejoice over some other action. The rock might admonish people or ask for favors. Humans for their past can address the rock to mollify or threaten it. Not only the rock but also the oak tree at the bottom of the hill is an animated being and so is a stream flowing below the hill is the spring of the forest cleaning the bushes growing around it the path of the clearing and the field mice wolves and crows that drink there in the animist world objects and living things are not only animated beings there are also immaterial entities the spirits of the dead the friendly and the malevolent beings the kind that we today call demons, fairies, and angels. Animists believe that there is no barrier between humans and other beings. They can call, communicate directly through speech, song, dance, and ceremony. A hunter may address a herd of a deer and ask that one of them sacrifice itself. If the hunt succeeds, the hunter may ask the dead animal to forgive them. When someone falls sick, a shaman can contact the spirit that caused the sickness and try to pacify it or scar it away. If need be, the shaman may ask for help from other spirits. What characterizes all these acts of communication is that the entities being addressed are local beings. They are not universal gods, but rather a particular deer, particular tree, particular stream, a particular ghost. Just as there is no barrier between human and other beings, neither is there a strict hierarchy. Non-human entities do not exist merely to provide for the needs of a man. Nor are they our powerful gods who run the world as they wish. The world does not revolve around humans or around any other particular group of beings. Animism is not a specific religion, it is a generic name of a thousands of different religions, cults or beliefs. What makes all them animist is this common approach to the world and to man's place in it. Saying that ancient foragers were probably animists is like saying that pre-modern agriculturists were mostly theists. Theism is the view that the universal order is based on a hierarchical relationship between humans and a small group of ethereal entities called gods. It is certainly true to say that pre-modern agriculture is tended to be theists, but it does not teach us about their particulars. The generic rubric theists covered Jewish rabbis from 18th century Poland, which burning Puritans from 17th century Massachusetts. Aztec priests from 15th century Mexico, Sufi mystics from 12th century Iran, 20th century Viking warriors, 2nd century Roman legionnaires, and 1st century Chinese bureaucrats. Each of these viewed the other beliefs and practices as weird as heretical. The difference between the beliefs and practices of groups and animistic foragers were probably just as big. Their religious experience may have been turbulent and filled with controversies reforms and revolutions. But these cautious generalizations are about as far as we can go. An attempt to describe the specifics of archaic spirituality is highly speculative as there is next to no evidence to go by and the little evidence we have. A handful of artifacts and the cave paintings can be interpreted in myriad ways. The theories of scholars who claim to know what the forgers felt shed much more light on the prejudices of their authors than on the Stone Age religions. Instead of erecting mountains of theory above or over a mole hill of tomb, relics, cave paintings and bone statutes, is the better to be frank and admit that we have only the haziest notions about the religions of ancient foragers. We assume that they were enemies but that's not very informative. We don't know which spirits they prayed to, which festivals they celebrated or which taboos they observed. Most importantly, we don't know what stories they are told. It's one of the biggest holes in our understanding of human history. The socio-political world of Faraja is another area about which we know next to nothing. As explained above, scholars cannot even agree on the basics such as the existence of private property, nuclear families or the monogamous relationship. It's likely that different bands had different structures. Some may have been a hierarchical and violent as the nastiest chimpanzees group, while others were as laid-back peaceful as lascivious as a bunch of bonobos. 
in Sangir, Russia, archaeologists discovered in 1955 a 30,000-year-old burial site belonging to a mammal hunting culture. In one grave, they found the skeleton of a 50-year-old man covered with the strings of mammoth ivory beds containing about 3,000 bees in the total. On the dead man's head was a hat decorated with fox teeth and on his wrist 25 ivory bracelets. Other graves from the same site contained far fewer goods. Scholars deduced that the Sungir Mammoth hunters lived in a hierarchical society and that the dead man was perhaps the leader of a band or of an entire tribe comprising several bands. It is unlikely that a few dozen members of a single band could have produced so many grave goods by themselves. Archaeologists then discovered an even more interesting tomb. It contained two skeletons buried head to head. One belonged to a boy aged about 12 to 13 and the other girl of about 9 or 10. The boy was covered with 5,000 ivory beads. He wore a fox tooth that had a belt with 250 fox teeth. The girl was adorned with 5,250 ivory beads. Both children were surrounded by statues and various ivory objects. A skilled craftsman probably needed about 45 minutes to prepare a single ivory bead. In other words, fashioning the 10,000 ivory beads that covered the two children, not to mention the other objects, required some 7,500 hours of delicate work, well over three years of labor by an experienced artisan. It is highly unlikely that at such young age the Sunga children had proved themselves as leader or mammoth hunters. Only cultural beliefs can explain why they received such an extravagant burial. One theory is that they owed their rank to their parents. Perhaps they were children of the leader in a cultural that believe in either family charisma or strict rules of succession. According to a second theory, the children had been identified at birth as the incarnation of some long dead spirits. A third theory argues that the girl burial reflects that way they died rather than their status in life. They were ritually sacrificed perhaps as part of burial rites of the leader and then entombed with pomp and circumstance. Whatever the correct answer, the Sungar children are among the best pieces of evidence that 30,000 years ago sapiens could invent social political codes that went far beyond the dictates of our DNA and the behavior patterns of other humans and animal species. Funny. There is a thorny question of the role of war in forager societies. Some scholars imagine ancient hunter-gatherer societies as peaceful paradise and argue that war and violence began only with the agricultural revolution. When people started to accumulate private property, other scholars maintain that the world of the ancient foragers were exceptionally cruel and violent. Both schools of thought are castles in the air, connected to the ground by the thin strings of meager archaeological remains and anthropological observations of the present-day foragers. The anthropological evidence is intriguing but very problematic. Foragers today live mainly in isolated and inhospitable areas such as the Arctic or the Kalahari Desert, where population density is very low and opportunities to fight other peoples are limited. Moreover, in recent generations, foragers have been increasingly subject to the authority of modern state, which prevents the eruption of large-scale conflicts. European scholars have had only two opportunities to observe large and relatively dense populations of independent foragers. In northwestern North America in 19th century and in northern Australia during the 19th and early 20th century, both Armenian and Aboriginal Australian cultures witnessed frequent armed conflicts. It is debatable, however, whether this represents a timeless condition or the impact of European imperialism. The archaeological findings are both scarce and opaque. What Tell tale clues might remain of any war that took place tens of thousands of years ago. There were no fortifications and walls back then, no artillery shells or even swords and shields. An ancient spear's point might have been used in war, but it could have been used in a hunt as well. Fossilized human bones are it no less hard to interpret. A fracture might indicate a war wound or an accident. Nor is the absence of fractures and cuts on the ancient skeleton conclusive proof that the person to whom the skeleton belonged did not die a violent death. Death can be caused by trauma of soft tissue that leaves no marks on bone. Even more importantly, during pre-industrial warfare, more than 90% of the war dead were killed by starvation, cold and disease rather than by weapons. Imagine that 30,000 years ago one tribe defeated its neighbor and expelled it from cover foraging grounds. 
In the decisive battle, 10 members of the defeated tribe were killed. In the following year, another 100 members of the losing tribe died from starvation, cold, and disease. Archaeologists who come across these one ten skeleton may too easily conclude that most fell victims under some natural disaster. How would we be able to tell that they were all victims of a merciless war? Duly warned, we can now turn to the archaeological findings. In Portugal, a survey was made for 400 skeletons from the period immediately predating the agricultural revolution. Only two skeletons showed clear marks of violence. A similar survey of 400 skeletons from the same period in Israel discovered a single crack in a single skull that could be attributed to human violence. A third survey of 400 skeletons from various pre-agricultural sites in the Danube Valley found evidence of violence on 18 skeletons. 18 out of 400 many not sound like a lot, but it's actually a very high percentage. If all 18 indeed died voluntarily, it means that about 4 to 5 percent of deaths in ancient Danube Valley were caused by human violence. Today, the globe average is only 1.5 percent taking war and crime together. During the 20th century, only 5 percent of human deaths resulted from human violence. And this is the century that saw the bloodiest wars and most massive genocides in history. If this Revelation is typical. The ancient Danube Valley was a violent as the 20th century. The depressing findings of the Danube Valley are supported by a string of equally depressing findings from other areas. At Jabal al Sahaba in the Sudan, a 12,000 years old cemetery containing 59 skeletons were discovered. Arrowheads and spear points were found embedded in or lying near the bones of 24 skeletons, 40% of the find. The skeleton of one woman revealed. 12. Injuries in Offnet Calf in Bavaria Archaeologists discovered the remains of 38 foragers, mainly women and children, who had been thrown into the two burial pits. Half the skeletons, including those of the children and babies, bore clear signs of damage by human weapons such as clubs and knives. The few skeletons belonging to a mature male bore the worst marks of violence. In all probability, an entire forager band was massacred at Offnet which better represents the world of an ancient forager, the peaceful skeletons from Israel and Portugal, or the abateurs of Jabal, Sahaba and Ofnet? The answer is neither. Just as forager exhibited a wide array of religions and social structures, so did too. They probably demonstrate a variety of violence rates. While some areas and some periods of time may have enjoyed peace and tranquility, others were riven by ferocious conflicts. If the larger picture of ancient forager life is hard to reconstruct, particular events are largely irretrievable. When a sapiens band first entered a valley inhabited by Neanderthals, the following years might have witnessed a breathtaking historical drama. Unfortunately, nothing would have survived from such an encounter except as best a few fossilized bones and a handful of stones, tools and that remain mute under the most intense scholarly inquisitions. We may extract from them information about human anatomy, human technology, human diet, and perhaps even human social structure. But they reveal nothing about the political alliance forged between neighboring sapiens bands about the spirits of the dead that blessed this alliance, or about the ivory beads secretly given to the local witch doctor in order to secure the blessing of the spirit. This curtain of silence shrouds end of thousands of years of history. These long millennia will, will have witnessed wars and revolutions, ecstatic religious movements, profound philosophical theories, incomparable artistic masterpieces, forages may have had their all-conquering. Napoleons who rule empire half the size of the Luxembourg, gifted Beethovens who lack symphony orchestras but brought people to tears with the sound of their bamboo flutes, and charismatic prophets who reveal the words of a local oak tree rather than those of a universal creator god, but these are all mere guesses. The curtain, the curtain of silence is so thick that we cannot even be sure such things occurred, let alone describe them in detail. Scholars tend to ask only those questions that they can reasonably expect to answer. Without the discovery of as yet unavailable research tools, we will probably never know what the ancient foragers believed or what political dramas they experienced. Yet it is vital to ask questions of, for which no answers are available, otherwise we might be tempered to dismiss. 60,000 to 70,000 years of human history with the excuse that the people who lived back then did nothing of importance. The truth is that they did a lot of important things. In particular, they shaped the world around us to a much larger degree than most people realize. 
trekkers visiting the Siberian tundra, the deserts of central Australia, and the Amazonian rainforest believe that they have entered pristine landscapes virtually untouched by human hands. But there's an illusion. The forests were there before us and they brought about dramatic changes even in the denser jungles and the most desolate wilderness. The next chapter explains how the forages completely reshaped the ecology of our planet long before the first agricultural village was built. The wandering bands of storytelling sapiens were the most important and most destructive force the animal kingdom had ever produced. Prior to the cognitive revolution, humans of all species lived exclusively on the Afro Asian landmass. True, they had settled a few islands by swimming short stretches of water or crossing them on improvised rafts. Flores, for example, was colonized as far back 850,000 years ago. Yet they were unable to venture into the open sea and none reached America, Australia or remote islands such as Madagascar, New Zealand and Hawaii. The sea barrier prevented not just human but also many other Afro-Asian animals and plants from reaching this outer world. As a result, the organism of distant land made Australia and Madagascar evolved in isolation for millions upon millions of years. Taking on shapes and natures very different from those of their distant Afro-Asian relatives. Planet Earth was separated into several distinct ecosystems, each made up of a unique assembly of animals and plants. Homo sapiens was about to put an end to this biological exuberance. Following the cognitive revolution, sapiens acquired the technology, the organizational skills and perhaps even the vision necessary to break out of Afro-Asian and settle the outer world. The first achievement was the colonization of Australia from 45,000 years ago. Experts are hard pressed to explain this feat. In order to reach Australia, human had to cross a number of seas channels, some more than 100 kilometers wide, and upon arrival they had to adopt nearly overnight to a completely new ecosystem. The most reasonable theory suggests that for about 45,000 years ago, the sapiens living in the Indonesian archipelago, a group of islands separated from Asia and from each other there by only narrow straits, developed the first seafaring societies. They learned how to build and maneuver ocean-going vessels and became long-distance fishermen, traders and explorers. This would have brought about an unprecedented transformation in human capabilities and lifestyles. Every other mammal that went to sea, seals, sea, crows, dolphins, had to evolve from aeons to develop specialized organs and a hydrodynamic body. The sapiens in Indonesia, descendants of apes who lived on the African savanna, became pacific seafarers without growing flippers and without having to wait for their noses to migrate to the top of their heads and whale did. Instead, they built boats and learned how to steer them. And these still skills enabled them to reach and settle Australia. True, archaeologists have yet to unearth rafts, oars, or fishing villages that date back as far as 45,000 years ago. Nevertheless, there is a strong circumstantial evidence to support this theory, especially the fact that in thousands of years following the settlement of Australia, Sapin colonized a large number of small and isolated islands to its north, some of such as Buka, Manus, were separated from the closest land by 200 kilometers of open water. It's hard to believe that anyone could have reached and colonized Manus without sophisticated vessels and sailing skills. As mentioned earlier, there is also firm evidence of a regular sea trade between some of these islands such as New Ireland and New Britain. The journey of a first human to Australia is one of the most important events in history, at least as important as Columbus' journey to America or the Apollo 2 expedition to the moon. It was the first time any human had managed to leave the Afro-Asian ecological system. Indeed, the first time any large terrestrial mammal had managed to cross from Afro-Asia to Australia. Or even greater importance was that the human pioneers did in this new world. The moment of the first hunter gatherer set foot on the Australian beach was the moment that Homo sapiens climbed to the top ring into the food chain and of particular landmass and thereafter became the deadliest species in the annals of planet Earth. Up until then, humans had displayed some innovative adaptations and behaviors, but their effect on their environment had been negligible. They had demonstrated remarkable success in moving into and adjusting to into various habitats, but they did not so without drastically changing those habitats. The settlers of Australia, or more accurately its conquerors, did not 
just adopt the transform the Australian ecosystem beyond recognition. The first human footprint on a sandy Australian beach was immediately washed away by the waves. Yet when the invaders advanced inland, they left behind us different footprints, one that would never be expunged. As they pushed on, they encountered a strange universe of unknown creatures that included a 200 kilogram, 2 meter kangaroo and a marusbeal lion, a massive modern tiger that was continent's largest predator. Koalas far too big to be cuddly and cute rustle into the trees and fightless birds twice the size of ostriches sprinted into the plains. Dragon-like lizards and snake five meters long slithered through the undergrowth. The giant Diprotodon, a two and a half ton wombat, roamed the forest. Except for the birds and reptiles, all these animals were marsupials, like kangaroos. They gave birth to tiny helpless fetus like young, which they turned nurtured with milk in abdominal pouches. Marsupial mammals were almost unknown in Asia and Africa, but in Australia they reigned supreme. Within a few thousand years, virtually all of these giants vanished. Of the 24 Australian animal species weighing 50 kg or more, 23 became extinct. A large number of smaller species also disappeared. Food chains throughout the entire Australian ecosystem were broken and rearranged. It was the most important transformation of the Australian ecosystem for millions of years. Was it all the fault of Homo sapiens? Some scholars try to exonerate our species, placing the blame on the vagaries of the climate. Yet it is hard to believe that Homo sapiens was completely innocent. There are three pieces of evidence. The weaken the climate alibi and implicate our ancestor in the extinction of the Australian megafauna. Firstly, even though Australia's climate changed some 45,000 years ago, it wasn't a very remarkable upheaval. It's hard to see how the new weather patterns alone could have caused such a massive extinction. It's common today to explain anything and everything as a result of climate change. But the truth is that Earth's climate never rests. It is in constant flux. Every event in history occurred against the background of some climate change. In particular, our planet has experienced numerous cycles of cooling and warming. During the last million years, there has been an ice age on every 100,000 years. The last one ran from about 70,000 to 15,000 years ago. Not unusually severe for an ice age, it had twin peaks, the first about 70,000 years ago and the second about 20,000 years ago. The giant dip duration of appeared in Australia more than 1.5 million years ago and successfully welded at least 10 previous ice ages. It also survived the first peak of the last ice age around 70,000 years ago. Why then did it disappear 45,000 years ago? Of course, if the Deprotodons had been the only large animal to disappear at this time, it might have been just a fluke. But more than 90% of Australia's megafauna disappeared along with the Deprotodon. The evidence is circumstantial, but it's hard to imagine that sapiens, just by coincidence, arrived in Australia. At the precise point that all these animals were dropping dead of the chills. Secondly, when climate change causes mass extinctions, sea creatures are usually hit as hard as land dwellers. Yet there is no evidence of any significant disappearance of oceanic fauna 45,000 years ago. Human involvement can easily explain why the wave of extinction obliterated and terrestrial megafauna of Australia while sparing that of only nearby oceans. Despite its burgeoning navigational abilities, Homo sapiens was still overwhelmingly a terrestrial menace. Thirdly, mass extinction akin to the Australian decimation occurred again and again in the ensuing millennia. Whenever people settle another part of the outer world, in these cases, sapiens guilt is irrefutable. For example, the megafauna of New Zealand, which had weathered the alleged climate change of 45,000 degrees years ago without a scar, suffered devastating blows immediately after the first human set foot on the island. The Maoris New Zealand's first sapiens colonizers reached the island about 800 years ago, 
Within a couple of centuries, the majority of the local megafauna was extinct, along with 60% of all bird species. A similar fail befell the mammoth population of the Wrangell Island in the Arctic Ocean. Mammoths had flourished for millions of years over, over most of the Northern Hemisphere, but as Homo sapiens spread, first over Eurasia and then over North America, the mammoths retreated. By 10,000 years ago, there was not a single mammoth to be found in the world, except for a few remote Arctic islands, most conspicuously Wrangell. The mammoths of Wrangell continued to prosper for a few more millennia, then suddenly disappeared about 4,000 years ago, just when the first humans reached the island. Were the Australian extinction isolated event, we could grant humans the benefit of the doubt, but the historical record makes Homo sapiens look like an ecological serial killer. All the settlers of Australia had at their disposal was Stone Age technology. How could they cause an ecological disaster? There are three explanations that mesh quite nicely. Large animals. The primary victims of Australian extinction breed slowly. Pregnancy is long, offsprings per pregnancy are few and there are long breaks between pregnancies. Consequently, if humans cut down even one diprodon, even few months, it would be enough to cause diprodon deaths to outnumber birds. Within a few thousand years, the last lenosome diprodon would pass away and with her the entire species. In fact, for all the size, diprodons and Australia's other giants probably wouldn't have been there hard to hunt because they would have been taken totally by surprise by their two-legged assailants. Various human species had been prowling and evolving in Africa for two million years ago. They slowly honed their hunting skills and began going after large animals around 400,000 years ago. The big beasts of Africa and Asia learned to avoid humans. So when the new mega predator, Homo sapiens, appeared on the afro scene, the large animals already knew to keep their distance from creatures that look like it. In contrast, the Australian giants had no time to learn to run away. Humans don't come across as particularly dangerous. They don't have long, sharp teeth or muscular lithe bodies. So when a diprotodon or large marsupial ever to walk the earth set eyes for the first time on this frail-looking ape, he gave it one glance and then went back to chewing leaves. These animals had to evolve a fear of a human kind. But before they could go or do so, they were gone. The second explanation is that by the time sapiens reached Australia, they had already mastered fire agriculture. Faced with an alien and threatening environment, they deliberately burned vast areas of impassable thickets and dense forests to create open grasslands which attracted more easily hunted game and were better suited to their needs. They thereby completely changed the ecology of large parts of Australia within a few short millennia. One body of evidence supporting this view is to fossil plant record. Eucalyptus tree were rare in Australia 45,000 years ago, but the arrival of Homo sapiens inaugurated a golden age for the species. Since eucalyptuses are particularly resistant to fire, they spread far and wide while other trees and shrubs disappeared. These changes in vegetation influenced the animals that we ate and the plants and the carnivores that ate the vegetarians. Koalas which subsist exclusively on eucalyptus leaves happily munched their way into new territories. Most other animals suffered greatly. Many Australians' food chains collapsed, driving the weakest links into extinction. A third explanation agrees that hunting and fire agriculture played a significant role in the extinction, but emphasizes that we can't completely ignore the role of climate. The climate changes the biggest Australia about 45,000 years ago, destabilized the ecosystem and made it particularly vulnerable. Under normal circumstances, the system would probably have recuperated as had happened many times previously. However, humans appeared on the stage at just this critical juncture and pushed the brittle ecosystem into the abyss. The combination of a climate change and human hunting is particularly devastating for large animals. Since it attacks them from different angles, it is hard to find a good survival strategy that will work simultaneously against multiple theaters. Without further evidence, there is no way of deciding between the three scenarios, but there are certainly good reasons to believe that if Homo sapiens had never gone down under, it would still be home to marsupial lions, diprotodons, and giant kangaroos. The extinction of the Australian megafauna was probably the first significant mark Homo sapiens 
left on our planet. It was followed by an even larger ecological disaster this time in America. Homo sapiens was the first and only human species to reach the western hemisphere. Arriving about 16,000 years ago, that is in around 14,000 BC, the first American arrived on foot, which they could do because at the time sea levels were low enough and that land bridge connected northeastern Siberia with northwestern Alaska. Not that it was easy, the journey was arduous, perhaps harder than the sea passage to Australia. To make the crossing, sapiens first had to learn how to withstand the extreme arctic conditions of northern Siberia, an area on which the sun never shines in winter and where temperature can drop to minus 50 degrees Celsius. No previous human species had managed to penetrate places like northern Siberia. Even the cold adopted Neanderthals restricted themselves to relatively warmer regions further south. But Homo sapiens, whose body was adapted to living in the African savanna rather than in the lands of snow and ice, devised ingenious solutions. When roaming bands of sapiens foragers migrated into colder climates, they learned to make snowshoes. An effective thermal clothing composed of layers of furs of skins sewn together tightly with the help of needles. They developed new weapons and sophisticated hunting techniques that enabled them to track and kill mammoths and the other big game of the far north. As their thermal clothing and hunting techniques improved, sapiens dared to venture deeper and deeper into the frozen regions and as they moved north, their close hunting strategies and other surviving skills continued to improve. But why did, why did they bother? Why banish oneself to Siberia by choice? Perhaps some bands were driven north by wars, demographic pressures, or natural disasters. Others might have been lured northward by more positive reasons such as animal protein. The Arctic land were full of large juicy animals such as reindeer, mammoths. Every mammoth was a source of vast quantity of meat which given the frosty temperatures could even be frozen for later use. Tasty fat, warm fur, and valuable ivory. As the finding from Sungir testify, mammoth hunters did not just survive in the frozen north, they thrived. As time passed, the band spread far and wide, pursuing mammoths, mastodons, rhinocores, and reindeer. Around 14,000 BC, the chase took some of them from northeastern Siberia to Alaska. Of course, they didn't know they were discovering a new world for mammoth and man alike. Alaska was mere extinction of Siberia. At first, glaciers blocked the way from Alaska to the rest of the America allowing no more than perhaps a few isolated pioneers to investigate the land further south. However, around 12,000 BC, global warming melted the ice and opened the easier passage, making us the use of new corridor. People moved south in Marse, spreading over the entire continent, though originally adopted to hunting large games in the Arctic. They soon adjusted to an amazing variety of climates and the ecosystem. Descendants of the Siberians settled the thick forests of the eastern United States, the swamps of the Mississippi Delta the deserts of Mexico and streaming jungles of the Central America. Some made their homes in the river world of the Amazon basin, others struck roots in the Andean mountain valleys or open pampas of Argentina. And all this happened in the mere millennium of two. By 10,000 BC, humans already inhabited the most southern point of America, the island of Terra del Fuego, at the continent's southern tip. The human blitz creek across America testify to the incomparable ingenuity and the unsurpassed adaptability of Homo sapiens. No other animal, no other animal had ever moved into such a huge variety of radically different habitats so quickly, everywhere using virtually the same genes. The settling of America was hardly bloodless. It left behind a long trails of victims. American fauna 14,000 years ago was far richer than it is today. When the first Americans marched south from Alaska into the plains of Canada and the western United States, they encountered mammoths and mastodons, rodents the size of bears, herds of horses and camels, oversized lions and dozens of large species, the likes of which are completely unknown today among them fearsome, saber-toothed cats and giant ground sloths that weighed up to 8 tons and had reached a height of 6 meters. South America hosted an even more exotic menagerie of large mammals, reptiles, and birds. The Americas were a great laboratory of evolutionary experimentation, a place where animals and plants unknown in Africa and Asia had evolved and thrived. But no longer. Within 2000 years of the sapiens' arrival, most of these unique species were gone. According to current estimates, within that short interval, North America lost 34 out of its 
47 genera of large mammals. South America lost 50 out of 60, the saber-toothed cats, after flourishing for more than 30 million years, disappeared and so did the giant ground sloths. The oversized lions, Native American horses, Native American camels, the giant rodents and mammoths. Thousands of species of smaller mammals, reptiles, birds and even insects and parasites also became extinct. For decades, paleontologists and zoo archaeologists, people who search for sturdy animal remains, have been combing the plains and mountains of Americas in search of the fossilized bones of ancient camels and petrified faces of giant ground sloths. When they find, when they seek, the treasures are carefully packed up and sent to laboratories where every bone and every coprotyle is meticulously studied and dated. Time and again these analyses yield the same results, the freshest dunk balls and the most recent camel bones dated to the period when humans flooded America. That is between approximately 1210 and 9000 BC. Only in one area have scientists discovered younger dung balls on several Caribbean islands, in particular Cuba and Hispaniola. They found petrified ground sloth scat dating to about 5000 BC. This is exactly the time when the first humans managed to cross the Caribbean Sea and settle these two large islands. Again, some scholars try to exonerate Homo sapiens and blame climate change, which requires them to posit that, for some mysterious reason, the climate in the Caribbean islands remained static for 7,000 years while the rest of the Western Hemisphere warmed. But in America, the dung ball cannot be dodged. We are the culprits. There is no way around the truth. Even if climate change abetted us, the human's contribution was decisive. If we combine the mass extinctions in Australia and America and add the smaller scale extinctions that took place at Homo sapiens spread over Afro-Asia, such as the extinction of all other human species and the extinctions that occurred when ancient foragers settled remote islands such as Cuba. The inevitable conclusion is that the first wave of sapiens colonization was one of the biggest and swiftest ecological disasters to befall the animal's kingdom. Hardest hit were the large furry creatures. At the time of the cognitive revolution, the planet was home to about 200 genera of large terrestrial mammals weighing over 50 kilograms. At the time of the agricultural revolution, only about 100 remained. Homo sapiens drove to extinction about half of the other's planet big beasts long before humans invented the wheel, writing on iron tools. This ecological tragedy was restaged in miniature countless times after the agricultural revolution. The archaeological record of island after island tells the same sad story. The tragedy opens with a scene showing a rich and varied population of large animals. Without any trace of humans, in scene two, sapiens appear, evidenced by a human bone, a spear point or perhaps a post head. Scene three quickly follows, in which men and women occupy a central stage and most large animals, along with many small ones, are gone. The large island of Madagascar, about 400 km east of the African mainland, offer a famous example. Though millions of years of isolation, a unique collection of animals evolved there. These included the elephants, birds, a flightless creatures 3 meters tall and weighing almost half a ton, the largest bird in the world, and the giant lemurs, the globe's largest primates the elephant birds and the giant lemurs along with the most and the other large animals of Madagascar suddenly vanished about 1500 years ago precisely when the first humans set foot on the island. In the Pacific Ocean the main wave of extinction began in about 1500 BC when Polynesian farmers settled the Solomon Islands, Fiji and the New Caledonia. They killed off directly or indirectly hundreds of species of birds, insects, snails, and other local inhabitants. From there, the wave of extinction moved gradually to the east, the south, and the north into the heart of the Pacific Ocean, obliterating on its way the unique fauna of Samoa and Tonga, the Marquis Islands, Easter Island, the Cook Island, and Hawaii, and finally New Zealand. Similar ecological disasters occurred on almost every one of the thousands of islands that pepper the 
Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, Arctic Ocean and Mediterranean Sea. Archaeologists have discovered on even the tiniest islands evidence of the existence of birds, insects and snails that lived there for countless generations only to vanish when the first human farmers arrived. None but a few extremely remote islands escaped man's notice until the modern age and these islands kept their fauna intact. The Galapagos Island, to give one famous example, remained uninhabited by humans until the 19th century, thus preserving their unique minagri, including their giant torotsoys, which like the ancient dipertodons, show no fear of humans. The first wave extinction which accompanied the spread of the foragers was followed by the second wave extinction which accompanied the spread of the farmers and gives us an important perspective on the third wave extinction which industrial activity is causing today. Don't believe tree buggers who claim that our ancestors lived in harmony with nature. Long before the industrial revolution homo sapiens held the record among all organisms for driving the most plant and animal species to their extinctions. We have the dubious distinction of being the deadliest species in the annals of biology. Perhaps if more people were aware of the first wave and second wave extinctions, they would be less nonchalant about the third wave, they are part of it. If we knew how many species we have already eradicated, we might be more motivated to protect those that still survive. This is especially relevant to the large animals of the oceans. Unlike their terrestrial counterparts, the large sea animals suffer relatively little from the cognitive and agricultural revolutions. But many of them are on the brink of extinction now as a result of industrial pollution and human overuse of oceanic resources. If things continue at the present pace, it is likely that whales, sharks, tuna and dolphins will follow the depredators, ground sloths and mammoths to oblivion. Among all the world's large creatures, the only survivors of the human flood will be human themselves. And the farmyard animals they serve as gallery slave in Noah's Ark.